SpaceX has always used the downtime to perform work on the orbital launch complex between flights. Flight 3 is no different from that. The star of the show is really the infrastructure instead of the vehicle this time. In this video, we want to present to you all the changes that happened between Flight 2 and Flight 3 and also show you what impact this had on the launch countdown and trajectory. Let's get started. Alright, let's start with the changes to the tank farm and then later move to the implications these changes have. The biggest change is certainly the increased capacity and capabilities of the tank farm. This means installing four new subcoolers and two new pumps on the liquid oxygen side. The obvious reason is to load the oxygen faster onto the vehicle. If you have more pumps and more subcoolers, you can accelerate the process. For the methane side, they also increased capabilities, with the installation of two subcoolers and one pump. Both sides also feature a new manifold, which will help accelerate the detanking that vehicles would have to go through in case of a scrub. The pressurization system for the whole orbital tank farm also saw some upgrades. It uses water and a set of heat exchangers in the fluid bunker to heat up some liquid oxygen, liquid methane or liquid nitrogen, which is then used as heated gas to get routed back into the main exchangers to raise the pressure. It is kind of similar to the pressurization that the vehicle has to do during flight. So how did they improve this? They removed one of the old water tank shells, which had shown multiple leaks in the past. If you remember, two of the previously decommissioned methane tanks were instead repurposed into water tanks to assist with the tank pressurization as well as supply for the detonation suppression system. Well, one of these tanks was removed and this system has now been additionally reinforced with the addition of some vertical and horizontal tanks that also store water. Extra vaporizers have also been installed, which will help on this as well. Some of the tank farm tanks also saw some reinforcements using steel beams and cross bracings to help the tank sustain the force fire of the 33 Raptors on Super Heavy. We saw that even with the deluge system in place during Flight 2, the tanks we previously said had been removed were badly damaged due to the overpressure from the engines. So essentially, these reinforcements on the tanks that were behind them are there in order to not repeat the same mistakes. These tanks are still in the line of fire. Down the line, SpaceX plans to increase the capabilities of the tank farm even more with an expansion and way later down the line potentially an overhaul. For the moment, SpaceX has brought nine new horizontal hot dog tanks, as Elon calls them, but these are not installed yet and hooked up to the tank farm. And they may not be for a while. In the not so distant future, we will also see the pad change radically, with a new launch tower and launch pad being built next door, where the suborbital pad is currently located. In fact, SpaceX has begun the transport tower segments for this tower and also start the fabrication of others as well. Furthermore, groundwork has already started and plans are in place to expand the launch site footprint to the west. In addition to the tank farm upgrades, SpaceX has added shielding to the tower base of the launch tower to protect the concrete which was being eroded by static fires and the two launches. SpaceX also built a blast wall to protect the newly installed parts of the liquid oxygen side of the tank farm along with protecting the comms bunker and other equipment. So how does all of this come together on launch day? Thanks to the wet dress rehearsal, we know how this impacts the countdown. And spoiler, SpaceX is succeeding in its goal of making the timeline faster. The WDR, after all, is the simulation of all the situations at launch, besides actually launching the system. So that really helps us to understand what is going on. But before all of this happens, the road needs to be closed and the pad needs to be cleared. And not only the small exclusion zone like during static fires, we are talking about a wide evacuation to make sure nobody is in danger of being in the blast area of Starship Super Heavy. The road closes at midnight local time for the attempt on Thursday, seven hours before the window opens. So SpaceX has plenty of time to get the tank farm ready to fuel the giant rocket and potentially perform electronic and other checkouts. Usually SpaceX will perform a pad clear around this time as well and even before that have swept the place for foreign object debris or thought which could liberate and fly once the Raptors ignite. 
that can not only damage infrastructure around but also raptors, as objects such as rocks could bounce up and damage the vehicle. Looking at the preconditioning of the tank farm before the prop load, it looks like SpaceX removed roughly 25 minutes of operations. Previously, it took 240 minutes from the moment the tank farm showed activity to the moment they loaded onto the vehicle. Now, they are at about 216 minutes. Of course, there is always the chance that the WDR had holes that we are not aware of. And somewhere in this tank farm operation, there is even more time to save. Only time will tell. Thanks to the timeline that SpaceX published on its website, we now know even more about the countdown site of Starship. Additionally, we can compare it to previous flight paths. At 1 hour and 15 minutes, the SpaceX flight director is verifying the go for propellant loading for this test. On flight 2, this was at a 2 hour mark, so at this point they want to speed up the operations by 45 minutes. It's getting more crazy after that. Let's look at booster locks and methane load. It started at 1 hour and 37 minutes. This has been moved by almost an hour. Booster LOX load now starts at 42 minutes, while methane load starts at 41 minutes. The difference here is striking. Looking at the ship, there are two interesting things. First, it is also significantly sped up from the second flight. The ship loading started at 1 hour and 17 minutes, now it is at 53 minutes. And second, and if you paid attention you will already know, the ship now starts before the booster. The ship holds significantly less propellant and should take a shorter time to fuel, but maybe the dedicated resources space expense on booster fueling just make it a tad faster than the ship, hence them starting with the upper stage first. Certainly interesting and a behavior we could observe on the latest wet dress rehearsal. We also got some new information regarding the wrapping up of the launch countdown. At 3 minutes and 30 seconds before T0, the booster propellant load will wrap up and the ship will wrap up 40 seconds later. This means the overall duration to fuel all super heavy is 39 minutes and 30 seconds. Some things also stayed the same. The flame deflector will start at 10 seconds and Raptors will fire at 3 seconds. This is the same as it was for the last flight and shows that SpaceX has gained some confidence about the startup sequence. The deflector system will also start up the Fire X system, which is used to get rid of gas bubbles below the pad. Friendly reminder about this, SpaceX can hold shortly before liftoff. If the times from the last flights are still valid for this one, SpaceX can hold for 15 minutes at the T-40 second mark. If it is similar to the last flight, the Raptors will initially turn on and the T0 marks essentially the moment where they start to go up to full throttle. Since Super Heavy is not secured by launch clamps at this time anymore, reaching a thrust to weight ratio of over 1.0 means liftoff. SpaceX expects to reach this at T plus 2 seconds. From this moment we have liftoff and reach the flight stage of this test. Remember, all of these milestones are based on current estimations from SpaceX and might be changed by the flight computer during the flight. For example, a failing or underperforming Raptor would change all of these timings already. We expect some differences and there are some indeed. Remember, while flight 1 and flight 2 targeted Hawaii, the third flight is targeting the Indian Ocean. What we can say based on the numbers we see, however, is that the overall energy SpaceX wants to demonstrate on this flight stays roughly the same. Both flights have their max Q, the peak maximum stress on the vehicle, at 52 seconds into the flight. Which makes sense as they both feature no payload and the overall ascent portion until Miko is not really that different. Miko happens 3 seconds earlier on flight 3. The booster in general will have a longer journey though. The landing burn shutdown was planned at 6 minutes and 48 seconds for flight 2, but now it is a whopping 16 seconds later at 7 minutes and 4 seconds. Miko also still involves the hot staging maneuver in which the engine of the upper stage is already spooling on while the first stage is still firing. The overall burn of the upper stage kinda stays the same. Just 2 seconds are between the cutoff time of 8.33 on flight 2 and 8.35 on 3. Remember, SpaceX will not return the booster completely or perform any catching attempts. This is more a simulation of the system for future catch attempts where they perform a landing of the booster in the Gulf. Now, let's look at the in-flight portion for Starship 28 in space. The payload door demonstration, the Raptor in space relight demo and the propellant transfer demo. 
In the payload door demonstration, SpaceX will demonstrate the opening and closing of the payload hatch for the PASS dispenser. This might pave the way for future flights to potentially deploy Starlings, which will be the first payload launched on Starship, and also the important early demand driver for the vehicle. Another milestone SpaceX wants to demonstrate is the in-space burn of a Raptor. In this, a Raptor will relight in space and demonstrate the ability to do that to, for example, perform deorbit burns in orbit an important capability to convince regulatory bodies of the safety of the system. The third demo is demoing the propellant transfer. In this, there will most likely be a transfer between the header tanks and main tanks. This is an in-body demonstration of something SpaceX has to do on a much larger scale in the future for the Artemis program and other high energy missions such as Mars. And finally, the landing. Re-entry will happen earlier on flight 3 as it was planned for flight 2. About 1 hour and 4 minutes after the mission starts, the Starship will perform a hard splashdown in the Indian Ocean. For Hawaii it would have needed 26 minutes more. And if we reach this point, we might look back at a very successful flight of Starship. But again, changes will happen. It's a test flight. Where do you think Booster and Ship will end up? Let us know in the comments. Thanks for watching and make sure to check out our marathon coverage on Wednesday, starting at 11pm Central.